You're good. All right. Uh, it's a great honor today to have uh, with us uh, Professor Walden Bellow, who is uh, an extremely well-known academic, environmentalist, social worker, human rights activist with, with decades of struggle for democracy and human rights in particular in Philippines. Uh, so welcome, Walden. It's, it's, it's a great honor, a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Thank you. Thank uh, you. In the recent times, Walden's work has been on globalization, on hegemony of global finance, on globalization of food systems. Uh, Walden's a recipient of several awards, including the Rights to Livelihood, Right to Livelihood Award. And uh, Walden's current affiliations are, uh, he's a senior research fellow at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Kyoto University. He's been professor of sociology at State University of New York at Binghamton. He's uh, co-founder, executive director of, uh, of uh, Focus on Global South and is currently based in Bangkok. Uh, well, uh, 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 Walden's a passionate uh, advocate of uh, the, the food sovereignty, the idea of food sovereignty, and uh, it's, it's great to have you with us, Walden, today uh, to speak on the, the, the issue of COVID-19 and uh, uh, what it means for, for food sovereignty. Uh, as usual, the format is that we'll get you to speak for half an hour, 45 minutes, 45 minutes if, if you like. Uh, and uh, the audience would ask questions, which after the session, I or uh, Professor Jayati Ghosh, who is going to join a bit in a bit, would one of us can ask you those questions and then uh, it will be one that you can respond. So that's essentially the format. Uh, the, and that's that's basically it. So, so, so over to you. Uh, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vikas, uh, yes. and I'm uh, very happy to be uh, participating in this uh, uh, webinar sponsored by uh, Ideas uh, Conference, uh, the Ideas um, Network, and to which I have been invited by Professor uh, Chayati Ghosh. I would just like to say uh, at the beginning that uh, just one uh, brief correction. Uh, I uh, was a co-founder of Focus in the Global South, but I am uh, no longer the executive director. I am a senior analyst. So uh, with that uh, brief um, uh, uh, introduction, uh, let me just begin. So the title of the presentation today uh, is COVID-19 provides an opportunity for breaking with the global food supply chain. Uh, now food has very much been very much uh, front and center in the COVID-19 story. Uh, first of all, hunger is following closely on the heels of the pandemic, especially in the global south. Uh, the United Nations World Food Program says that the pandemic will double the number of people experiencing acute food insecurity from 130 million in 2019 to 265 million in 2020. Now this figure is likely to be a gross underestimate, says Vijay Prashad of the Tricontinental uh, Research uh, Center. Um, and he says that over 2.5 billion people can be expected to be rendered hungry by the pandemic. And I tend to agree with him. Indeed, one can say that unlike in East Asia, Europe and the United States, in South Asia, the food calamity preceded the actual invasion by the virus. With relatively few infections registered in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh as of mid-March of 2020, but with millions already displaced by the lockdowns and other draconian measures that were taken by the region's governments at that time. In India, as the renowned writer 
P. Sainath, uh, founder of the People's Archive of Rural India, uh, put it, uh, and I quote, we gave a nation of 1.3 billion human beings four hours to shut down their lives. One of our legendary civil servants had said, a small infantry brigade being pushed into a major action is given more than four hours notice, unquote. With little money for food and rent, migrant workers were forced to trek hundreds of kilometers home with scores of them beaten up by police seeking to quarantine them as they crossed state lines. Estimated at some 139 million, this uh, internal migrants largely invisible in normal times uh, suddenly became visible as they tried to reach their home states, deprived of public transportation owing to the sudden national lockdown. With people dying along the way, a constant refrain in this vast human wave were the desperate words, if coronavirus doesn't kill us, hunger will. The second point I would like to underline and will devote the rest of this presentation to is that the pandemic has shown that the global supply chain, the dominant agribusiness model is fragile and threatened with breakdown with incalculable consequences and it is time to do away with it. The fragility of the global food supply chain, often abbreviated as FSC, was impressed on us a couple of weeks ago by a joint declaration of the World Trade Organization, World Health Organization and Food and Agriculture Organization or FAO. The three institutions warned that, and I quote, when acting to protect the health and well being of their citizens, countries should ensure that any trade related measures do not disrupt the global supply chain, unquote. One particular case appeared to have triggered the agency's concern the blockade of food exports in Rosario, Argentina. According to an FAO report, and I quote, Rosario in cent central Argentina is the country's major grain export hub, as well as a major soybean area. It is the world's largest exporter of soybean livestock feed. Recently, dozens of municipal governments near Rosario have blocked grain trucks entering and exiting their towns to slow down the spread of the virus. Many are defying the federal government's order to unblock their roads, citing health concerns. Soybeans are therefore not being transported to crushing plants, affecting the country's export of soybean milk meal for livestock. Similarly, in Brazil, another key exporter of staple commodities, there are reports of logistical hurdles putting the food supply chains at risk. Internationally, if a major port like Santos in Brazil or Rosario in Argentina shuts down, it would spell disaster for global trade." Unquote. Now, the Rosario blockade was carried out by local governments and civil society groups that wanted to protect themselves from what they saw as a global supply chain that had allowed the virus to hitchhike to their communities. But the FAO was not sympathetic to their concerns. What was critical, said Hu Dong Yu, head of the FAO, was for the international community to avoid disruptions of corporate controlled global food supply chains. The event that informed the response of the FAO and other international agencies to the Rosario blockade was the food price crisis of 2007-2008, when export restrictions imposed by food exporting countries worried about domestic supplies, contributed to food shortages and skyrocketing prices of food in food importing countries resulting in 75 million people joining the ranks of the hungry and driving an estimated 125 million people in developing countries 
into extreme poverty. Now, the FAO and the WTO are certainly right to be worried that disruptions of global and regional supply chains could contribute to the spread of hunger. But what is really disturbing is the absence of any awareness that global and regional supply chains are themselves the problem when it comes to ensuring global food security. The 2007-2008 food crisis was, should have taught these agencies this sobering lesson, but there is the same uncritical endorsement of the global food supply chain. The 2007-2008 crisis was triggered by a number of developments, including financial speculation in commodities, as well as the transfer to land, of land to cultivate in biofuels. However, these short-term triggers would not have led to a global crisis had not a number of structural conditions been created, chief among them the globalization of capitalist industrial agriculture through the creation of a process of production, the dynamics of which was, as Harriet Friedman puts it, quote, the suppression of particularities of time and place in both agriculture and diets. More rapidly and deeply than before, transnational agri-food capitals disconnect production from consumption and relink them through buying and selling. They have created an integrated productive sector of the world economy and peoples of the third world have been incorporated or marginalized, often both simultaneously as consumers and producers." Unquote. That was from Harriet Friedman. Now, the 2007-2008 food crisis and the 2008-2009 global financial crisis should have shown the multilateral agencies the fragility of global supply chains. In the food system, in the case of the first crisis, and in the industrial system, in the case of the second, when the financial crisis led to a global recession that halted factories in China. The two crises should have triggered serious interrogation of the resiliency of the global supply chain. Instead, in the case of agriculture, the global supply chain stretched farther and farther and local and regional food systems withered even more. The FAO estimates that global agricultural trade more than tripled in value to around $1.6 trillion from 2000 to 2016. More and more local and regional food uh, systems that provide most of domestic production and consumption of food have retreated so that today modern food supply chains dominated by large processing firms and supermarkets, capital intensive, with relatively low labor intensity of operations constitute roughly 30 to 50% of the food systems in China, Latin America, and Southeast Asia, and 20% of the food systems in Africa and South Asia. Let me just repeat that food supply chains now constitute roughly 30 to 50% of the food systems in China, Latin America, and Southeast Asia, and 20% of the food systems in Africa and South Asia. The bulk of the evidence is that the gains from the so-called high standards agricultural trade, promoted by value chains that impose strict quality controls on local producers, are captured by foreign investors, large food companies, and developing country elites. Vertical integration and consolidation at the buyer and export chains, uh, buyer end of export chains, are strengthening the bargaining power of large agro industrial firms 
and food multinationals displacing decision-making authority from the farmers to these downstream companies and expanding the capacity of these companies to extract rents from the chain to, this, to the disadvantage of contracted smallholder suppliers in the chains. The smallholder, in fact, the small farmer is being squeezed out at almost every level from production to finance, to meeting sanitary and phyto phytosanitary standards, all of which benefit corporate agriculture with its big buyers, big suppliers, and big middlemen. One well-known liberal institute sums up the smallholders plight uh, thus, and I quote, increasingly globalized and liberalized agri-food markets are dominated by supermarkets, distributors, processors, and agro-exporters that are introducing and expanding food safety and quality standards that many smallholders are unable to meet. These developments are further shifting the competitive advantage away from smallholder farmers towards large-scale producers. Increasingly, foreign investors are pushing out smallholders even from land ownership. Many land acquisitions, notably in Africa, are really land grabs, according to one important source. Since the competition for investment, the weak capacity of states, and the complex implications of titling and clarification of property rights are all factors that have impeded the establishment of robust regu regulatory frameworks to protect local communities from land grubs. Unquote. Now, we said earlier that the FAO and other multilateral agencies continue to endorse the global supply chain, despite the many problems associated with it. This goes against the impression of many in the NGO community and government that the FAO has become more sympathetic to the needs of small farmers. This image is erroneous. To take just one example, in Myanmar, which is considered the last frontier of development in Southeast Asia by the multilateral agencies, the FAO teamed up with the Asian Development Bank and the Livelihood and Food Security Trust Fund to draw up an agricultural development plan that, in their own words, focuses on ensuring that, quote, farmers and agro-enterprises are integrated into effective value chains and are competitive in regional and global markets. This is achieved by facilitating the process of transforming the agricultural sector from a situation where a substantial proportion of farming is carried out primarily for subsistence or for local markets into a sector in which most farming is carried out for profitable commercialization and connected to the local, national, and international markets." Unquote. So in fact, ever since 2011, this has been pushed on Myanmar, the commercialization into the international market of what uh, uh, has been traditionally, you know, a um, uh, country that is to a high degree food self-sufficient. Now, the very real drawbacks of integrating local agricultural, uh, agricultural systems into the global supply chain and eroding food self-sufficiency are commonsensical. But trapped by neoliberal ideology, the FAO and other multilateral institutions have simply brushed them aside. Agricultural analyst Jennifer Clapp has provided several critical reasons why moving towards greater food self-sufficiency makes very good sense. Let me just cite four of the reasons uh, that she uh, advances. One, when a large proportion of a country's population is at risk of hunger in instances of sudden food shortages, 
due to the vagaries of world markets as happened in 2007 and 2008, it is vital to carefully consider ways to improve domestic food production. Two, countries with volatile export earnings can derive benefits in reducing reliance on global food markets. Three, in fact, the majority of the world's countries do have the resource capacity to be food self-sufficient. But of those countries that have the resource capacity to be food self-sufficient, according to Platt, a number of them are net food importers. Many Sub-Saharan African countries, for example, were net agricultural exporters in the 1960s and 1970s, but became net importers of food after the 1980s. Some of the these countries that have become reliant on imported food since the 1980s still have the capacity to produce sufficient foodstuffs domestically, including Guinea, Mali, Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, if they have the political will to do so. Four, countries facing the threat of trade disruptions as a result of war, political tensions, or other emergencies may also benefit from greater levels of food self-sufficiency. Most countries consider the ability to ensure food supplies in times of crisis to be a national security issue. And depending on the risk that imports will be cut off due to conflict or political tensions, countries may want to invest in their domestic agricultural capacity. This imperative is especially relevant now during the COVID-19 pandemic, but it is one that many countries can effectively address immediately because they have lost the capacity to be self-sufficient owing to neoliberal prescriptions and corporate power. The COVID-19 pandemic is a crisis that can translate into an opportunity to move food production away from fragile corporate controlled globalized food supply chains based on narrow considerations such as the reduction of unit cost to more, to more sustainable smallholder based localized systems. Now, while in the short term, global food supply chains must be kept running to ensure that people do not starve, the strategic goal must be to replace them. And some measures can already be taken even as the pandemic is at its height. For instance, in many cities under lockdown, produce from the countryside is available even as the global supply chain stops functioning. But the produce ruts and peasants lose money because the lockdowns prevent food from entering the city. And I think you have many cases of this in India uh, and other places at this point. Or peasants and fishers cannot do productive work even if they observe precautions such as the two meter social distance rule because emergency directives that are not appropriate to the local situation uh, um, uh, are, are, are in effect. If under appropriate emergency rules, the combined force of peasants and fishers can be unleashed in a safe and cautious manner. Much of the current problem of supply chain for cities can be significantly reduced. In addition, it can help prevent, mitigate any possi possible future food supply shortages where peasants and the landless rural poor are themselves among the first to suffer and to starve. So these immediate measures of reconnecting the local countryside uh, with the cities, uh, which have been disconnected by the global supply chains, you know, can be taken at this point in time uh, with um, um, measures that are appropriate uh, to the local situation to ensure public health. Uh, but these measures, in fact, are not being taken with this 
uh, kind of um, um, uh, indiscriminate lockdown rules in many countries. So these are measures for the short term. When talking about strategic transformation, there are solid reasons for reserving the trend towards the globalization of food production and moving more towards food self-sufficiency. However, the rationale goes beyond just ensuring food self-sufficiency to achieve food security to fostering values and practices that enhance community, social solidarity, and democracy. So we need to go beyond just assuring food self-sufficiency. This paradigm shift was what we might call the road not taken after the food price crisis of 2007 and 2008, as the transnational agri-food interests and their ideologues asserted their power to preserve and expand the global food supply system. There were, however, representatives of the peasantry and civil society groups who met in Nieleni, Mali, shortly before the crisis broke out to articulate a different vision and a different path from the agribusiness road, one that has become popularly known as food sovereignty. The resulting Nieleni Declaration proclaimed that the, food, that the aim of food sovereignty was, and I quote, a world where all peoples, nations, and states are able to determine their own food producing systems and policies that provide every one of them with good quality, adequate, affordable, healthy, and culturally appropriate food, end quote. Led by peasants and smallholders who still produce some 70% of the world's food, this movement proposes the alternative paradigm of food sovereignty, the cornerstone principles of which include the following. One, local food production must be delinked from corporate dominated global supply chains, and each country should strive for food self-sufficiency. This means the country's farmers should produce most of the food consumed domestically. This is not, it should be stressed, the corporate concept of food security that says that a country can also meet a great part of its food needs through imports. Again, uh, let me just say that food self-sufficiency is not the same as food security. Food security is a concept that has been perverted by corporations to mean you know, that you can meet your food needs, most of it through imports. The second principle, the people should have the right to determine their patterns of food production and consumption, taking into consideration rural and productive diversity and not allow these to be subordinated to unregulated international trade. Third, localization of food production is good for the climate since the carbon emissions of localized production on a global scale are much less than that of agriculture based on global supply chains. Fourth, traditional peasant and indigenous agricultural technologies contain a great deal of wisdom and represent the evolution of a largely benign balance between the human community and the biosphere. Thus, the evolution of agrotechnology to meet social needs must take traditional practices as a starting point rather than regarding them as obsolete. And fifth, a technology supportive of food sovereignty is agroecology, which is marked by recycling nutrients and energy on the farm rather than introducing external inputs and diversifying plant species and genetic resources over time and space. These are just a few of the core principles of um, the paradigm of food sovereignty, which again, I must emphasize has been 
advanced principally by peasants and small holders, okay? and really not by uh, academics and intellectuals. Um, academics and intellectuals have uh, become quite, many of them have become quite supportive of this paradigm, but it is not them that have, uh, that ha have articulated it. It has mainly come from the producers, the small producers themselves. Uh, to be sure, there are many questions related to the economics, politics, and technology of food sovereignty that remain unanswered, or to which its proponents give varying and sometimes contradictory answers. But a new paradigm is not born perfect. What gives it its momentum are the irreversible crisis of the old paradigm and the conviction of a critical mass of people that it is the only way of surmounting the problems of the old system and opening up new possibilities for the fulfillment of values that people hold dear. As with any new form of organizing social relationships, the unanswered questions can only be answered and the ambiguities and contradictions can only be ironed out through practice since practice has always been the mother of possibilities. It has been said that one should never let a good crisis go to waste. The silver lining of the COVID-19 crisis, at least when it comes to agriculture, is the opportunity that it spells for a new paradigm such as that of food sovereignty. So I would just like to end there. Thank you very much uh, for to everybody who's been participating in this uh, webinar. And I believe that um, Professor Yati Ghosh has uh, arrived. And yes, uh, yes, yes. so we, we can definitely go into our discussion uh, at this point. Hi, uh, Walden, it's such a... Uh, tragedy for me that I missed the first part of your talk, but I'm going to catch up and listen to it later. But meanwhile, we've already got a whole bunch of very interesting questions. And so I'm just going to ask you some of these to begin with. The first one is, while only local production distribution systems can bring resilience, what do you see is the critical trigger to push the transition from industrial systems to one based on food sovereignty? Uh, yes, uh, you, you know, definitely uh, uh, the trigger, okay. And I think uh, uh, there are probably several triggers <laughs> to this. Uh, and uh, one of the triggers that I can see right now and which the, uh, this talk has been about is the opportunity provided by this crisis. The global food supply chains are breaking down and according to a number of reports, the breakdowns are going to be even greater uh, in the coming months. We are just beginning to see this. Uh, and um, at this point in time, um, uh, it is very important that while it is important to keep uh, you know, a global trade going, um, we can already begin the process of um, getting local uh, producers to become linked again to the cities in their particular region and establishing those links that have been killed by the regional or global food supply chains. So my, my sense is, you know, that, um, that a lot of this is in fact going to happen. Okay. Like, yeah. uh, uh, and I think that, the important thing is to make sure that these are not just emergency temporary measures, but they in fact become a part of a strategic transformation, uh, moving uh, towards a food productive system that really serves people rather than you know, the profit needs of, of, of corporations. Because um, uh, I think that um, um, unless governments, um, local, regional, uh, uh, and central governments step in, uh, uh, then this spontaneous measures uh, uh, to, to fill in the gap that has been uh, um, 
that is created by the, this, the so-called quote unquote disruptions, um, uh, they may be turned back uh, once uh, things become what they call the restore the, the old normal. So, yeah. uh, so I, I would say therefore that, um, that um, you know, that, that, you know, this crisis, um, terrible as it is, um, uh, uh, provides uh, also an opportunity for transformation. I think I agree with you. I think that's actually quite, and probably it's much more likely to happen in food than in many other things, uh, sectors. So that, that, that's actually a very interesting point. There's a question here, which I'm finding a little hard to understand, Walden, but also because I missed the first part of your presentation. But the question is this, can global supply chains serve local food sovereignty in the transition to a strong movement towards relocalization and bioregional circular economy? Now, I, 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 I thought the two were contradictory, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, can you give some examples, please? Maybe I should repeat this. Can global supply chains serve local food sovereignty in the transition to a strong movement towards relocalization and bioregional circular economy? I thought the idea was to get away from them, but maybe I, I'm wrong. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, the answer that I can give there is uh, what I guess I, I, I had said earlier that um, the problem that we face right now is this global supply chains have become so dominant, you know, that uh, disruptions uh, can in fact result in people starving uh, okay. and many people being drove, driven to hunger. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, that um, we need to keep that global trade going, but at the mm -hmm. same time, we already move away from it. Uh, you know, like, um, like I, I said, you know, already you can, you know, with, with, with food supplies to cities, for instance, uh, dropping, the local countryside can begin to, in fact, move in uh, to fill that. So it's important, therefore, that even as we keep trade going, we already have a process of transformation that is moving that will eventually make those global supply chains irrelevant to this new other system that's being created spontaneously on the ground. I think that's probably what okay. the person- I'm, uh, I'm very glad, and now I'm glad that question was asked because this has actually made it clear to me as well. Okay, so there's a question about the fact that in many countries, there are stimulus measures for agriculture. In post COVID-19 policies of um, many governments and the stimulus measures for agriculture are being debated. How do we make governments include smallholder farmers' concerns in these measures? How do we bring that yes. in? Yes. No. Uh, well, I, I think um, uh, it would be uh, very critically important for citizens to find a way, uh, even in these lockdowns, whereby uh, uh, we are confined uh, in terms of our advocacies to uh, online kind of meetings and online lobbying, uh, I think we should really find a way uh, to be able to create lobbies through, you know, through the internet of citizens' lobbies that that can yeah. that can pressure uh, parliaments uh, to make sure that they uh, do not exclude or forget. Um, um, uh, a rejuvenation of agriculture, uh, promoting uh, agriculture, agroecology, uh, mm -hmm. along food sovereignty lines uh, in, in this process. So I think that what is key right now is that farmers uh, groups and citizens groups supporting farmers, um, uh, uh, in fact, um, make sure that they, uh, uh, that their voices are heard um, not only online, but possibly even through whatever space there is physically to be able to articulate, a, you know, their demands. So I think citizen pressure is key at this point in time. Okay, so there is an interesting question about inequalities within the agrarian system. So, for example, in India, there are 80% smallholders and many of them are net buyers of food. 
So how do we deal with this solution? How, how would it work when given this kind of inequality already? Yes, I, I mean, I, I think, uh, I, I think it, is, it is critically important, uh, you know, that not only to, to emphasize that it is not only in India, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, you have these inequalities in the countryside so that uh, I really, I, I feel that it's, it is very important to be able to recognize uh, the fact that these inequalities um, exist and uh, they, they create such tremendous poverty uh, and uh, difficulties, uh, you know, for people to, uh, uh, to, to maintain their lives. So um, my sense is that, um, and the food sovereignty, um, the food sovereignty uh, uh, paradigm and the people promoting food sovereignty have always been promoting, uh, you know, that you cannot have food sovereignty unless you have uh, equality, that you have land redistribution, uh, and you have uh, basically uh, you have property systems, you know, that respect the rights of uh, indigenous communities, for instance. Uh, so, um, so without um, measures of land redistribution and respect for uh, communal uh, systems of land tenure uh, and systems that promote uh, the interests of smallholders, uh, I don't think you will really move very far in terms of a uh, paradigm of food sovereignty. So, so two things are very, uh, uh, I would just like to emphasize here. One is the importance in terms of equality uh, in terms of access to resources, and especially land. And secondly, uh, it would also be important to make sure, you know, that this process um, is, uh, you know, the, the food system and the tenure system, uh, you know, is also something that is uh, ecologically uh, um, uh, supportive of the ecology of, of the environment. I can see a follow-up question to that, Walden, which would be that that actually requires some kinds of possibly, you know, not revolution, but certainly dramatic social change in the countryside. But these are not going to be things that happen on their own, these changes in tenure and, and so on. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I would say that uh, although, uh, as you said, Chayati, that um, maybe transformation in the country in, in terms of the global food system might be a better place to start this, the whole process of transformation. Uh, and um, I don't think that it can go very far without a more holistic transformation of the system. So the, the, the power relations in the countryside um, cannot be divorced from the overall national and international power relations. So I think that I think it's very. I, I thank the speaker for, for uh, the, the, the person who raised that question, uh, because uh, it, this is extremely important that you know this process be located within a more holistic transformation of the power system. So there's an interesting question, uh, which is general, but also relating to the Philippines. How do we prevent governments from going back to pre-COVID-19 interventions? Like in our country, the Philippines, we haven't lifted the ECQ, and yet the government is already thinking of importing again. Yes, uh, well, this is the, you know, this is, you know, definitely, you know, we have a government in the Philippines uh, under the uh, Mr. Duterte, uh, you know, that uh, has, uh, in fact, um, uh, effectively killed the rice industry or, or you know, it, 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 it had the so-called Rice Tarification Act, you know, that uh, basically has, um, has made life very difficult uh, for our small farmers, especially our rice producing farmers. So I, I, I think that uh, this threat of, you know, massive importation uh, 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 instead of relying on local production, instead of showing uh, 
uh, you know that that uh, you know this is where local producers can step in uh, and provide you know the the food for the different local areas in the cities. Um, that I think is 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 something that should be pushed on the government, for instance, on the government of the Philippines, that this is an opportunity to move this way to rejuvenate agriculture, to rejuvenate ag rice agriculture, rather than the easy way of just bringing in food imports under this old neoliberal kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, system. So that I think uh, it is, I think that would be important for both farmers groups as well as uh, civil society groups are very supportive of farmers and especially of smallholders to intervene at this at this uh, uh, point in time. It's of course, uh, being from the Philippines, I know this is a very hard struggle against a government that is very neoliberal, ne neoliberal in, its, it, in its thinking. We know the feeling, Walden. We're all in that struggle against very neoliberal and in our case, also very cruel governments. <laughs> but, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, there is, yes. There's, there's this a question on uh, urban and peri-urban food farming as a way forward in promoting food sovereignty, given increasing urbanization. And that's quite interesting because, you know, even in, in India, about 10% of our population in urban areas does farming. So it's... it's yes, uh, I, 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 I think that the... Uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, propositions of the food sovereignty paradigm has, in fact, been encouraging the rise of urban farming. Okay, uh, as urban smallholder farming, uh, and to link up uh, rural smallholders with urban um, uh, and peri-urban producers, uh, and this is a very uh, creative uh, kind of interaction that can take place. Um, uh, and uh, linking this two in a more conscious way could, in fact, pose, a, a, you know, a, a, could could create a, a, a strong force to displace the regional or uh, international food supply chain. So I, I would really say that uh, that is an alliance that needs to be forged. I presume you must have talked about cooperatives in your discussion because clearly. A lot of this would not be possible without forming cooperatives yes. in rural and urban and peri-urban areas. And then the possibilities of federating them, of linking them up, become much greater. Yes, yes. I, I, did not, uh, I did not specifically mention uh, cooperatives, but definitely I, I think they're a system of property relations uh, you know, that in, in fact would be very supportive of a food sovereignty and food self-sufficiency paradigm. So there is a, a question on the locust plague, which is already having far reaching spread like coronavirus in various countries. Certainly we know in Africa, in fact, it's even come in India now and I imagine in parts of Southeast Asia as well. So how much of a problem is the locust plague? Well, as I understand it, especially in parts of Africa, it is a major problem at this point in time. And you know that um, it, it, it it's going to intensify the crisis of the global food supply chain. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, my 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 sense, I, I you know, is is that uh, there are key parts of 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 of, uh, of Africa, you know, that uh, even before COVID nineteen, uh, were already facing uh, uh, real challenges from these plagues. You know, so. Uh, I think it is extremely important to bring that into the equation, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of um, international support uh, for, you know, those sectors of the global south that are facing this two, this twin uh, plagues, both COVID-19 and, and the locust plague. You know, this is a kind of, if you like, environmental challenge, and I think it links in with other things that I've heard you speak about in terms of the climate challenge and how uh, a, a form of deglobalization and especially of farming systems is is a important response even to the climate challenge. Sure. So I wonder if you want to just link those. Uh, it's 
I, this is, I'm just trying to cover all of the, there's a, there's finally, I'm going to take this as the final question because there's so many over here, but uh, there are a couple that I have uh, uh, ignored. One of them was about how the economic packages that have been done so far don't seem to cover farm sector adequately and support and prices. Up. They've never been commensurate with the requirements of farmers. I think you probably covered that discussion sure. already. But there's, uh, there's one that says, is it really possible for all countries to become self-sufficient in the production of food? Even for a large country like India, for which self-sufficiency has been a strategic goal, it would not be possible to produce enough food without importing resources. For example, we're hugely dependent on fertilizer imports. There would be other small countries where it is simply not possible to produce enough food to feed everyone. And I think that links in to the impact of things like, you know, the low caste and, and, and so on. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think that uh, if I recall right, a number of people, including uh, one of, uh, you know, food analysts uh, that I cited, Jennifer Clapp, has shown, in fact, you know, that the majority of countries, you know, can achieve substantial food self-sufficiency. I don't think that anybody has ever said, you know, that you have 100% uh, food uh, self-sufficiency. Uh, 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 so uh, it does seem like the majority of countries in, in the world today uh, have the resource base by which, you know, they, they can in fact uh, move towards a fair degree of self-sufficiency at the level of say 70 to 80 percent even, you know. So, so that's, that's there. It's, it's the, the, the problem really is, you know, that you do have you know, neoliberal ideologues that ignore these facts and basically say that what is important is reducing the unit cost of production. And, you know, some countries are just not meant to be, uh, you know, to be uh, food self-sufficient because mm -hmm. that's so inefficient, okay? So I, I think the problem is really this paradigm, this neoliberal paradigm and not the actual realities of capabilities to move towards a high degree of uh, food uh, uh, self-sufficiency. So um, uh, the second thing, of course, that has been mentioned in, in this process is that um, uh, we do need to link up the climate issue to the, the various uh, uh, plagues and crisis of agriculture that have been happening because I, I think it is fairly clear that, you know, many of these crises are interlinked at this point in time and are very much linked to the, um, the, the climate crisis and the way that a lot of the interactions between the natural habitat and the human habitat uh, are becoming really very destructive precisely because of the way, you know, that the climate crisis is pushing the human communities into areas that, 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 that they should not be in uh, and, and therefore creating these very destructive uh, interactions. Uh, so so I, I think that, that we need to fact, we need to bring this in, you know, that uh, we really cannot have, uh, um, um, a, uh, a paradigm to replace the uh, the, uh, the 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 global uh, food supply chain system. We cannot have one that is not sensitive to the to the to the climate, uh, and that it must be one that has a very benign kind of relationship with the climate. And that's why um, uh, you know a food sovereignty paradigm, one that is promoted by smallholders that is in fact, um, um, you know, that uses agroecology that uh, in fact this, it has been shown, you know, that the carbon emissions from this localized uh, uh, food production systems are much, much less than those connected with corporate big plantation agriculture. Well, then that was fantastic. I mean, you, you know, you, you really uh, always manage to bring everything together in this wonderful way. Very, so clear, but also so comprehensive. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I Thank really you. enjoyed hearing you. Respond to things. That was, it was terrific. And I think it will be 
quite inspirational for a lot of our, for the young people who are listening in terms of envisioning an alternative future, which we can actually all try and somehow manage to strive towards. So that was yes, great. Uh, Thank well, you. yes, and, and thank you to Ideas and to all the participants in this meeting. I, I think that uh, uh, l my last word here is, uh, I think that if we have the will, we can take advantage of this crisis to create an opportunity for another kind of world. Uh, and, you know, uh, yeah. when we're talking about here, uh, in, with respect to transforming our food systems to become much more sensitive uh, to the needs of people rather than uh, um, the big people, the corporations. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, it is. It, yeah, yes, please. Oh, I will have the. Uh, I will send you the um, the the, uh, uh, the the talk itself. Oh yes, I, please. I will be sending it to you. So all the participants. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, you know, can, so everybody. Can access it. Everybody, we will have the lecture also available online. So that's wonderful news. And uh, thank you, Walden. That, that's such a good note to end on because in a period when we are surrounded by gloom and thinking about terrible things, it's wonderful to, to think of how we can use this opportunity to actually build something that is more sustainable and desirable for everyone. So that's, that's great. Very, very thank happy you. note to end on. Um, thank you. I want to just thank you. Thank you, Walden. I want to also remind everybody that tomorrow we have uh, the last lecture in this week of the series, and it's going to be by Jose Antonio Acampo, who is a, a former finance minister of Colombia, former under secretary general of the United Nations, and is uh, obviously an expert on many issues internationally and nationally. He's going to be talking about the Latin American situation and about how multilateral financial support for Latin America during the COVID-19 crisis has played out. As you can imagine, it hasn't played out very well, but he has some very interesting ideas about how we can all demand that it work better. I think that's also a very interesting thing because that's also going to be a test case of whether the international community can actually muster the necessary support that we need for a global response to the COVID crisis. So thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, Walden, for that wonderful presentation and that very, very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.